So, we'll continue again from Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4, talking about the ministry gift. We talked about the manifestation. The manifestation of the Spirit. We talked about it in different ways. And I'm sure that a lot of us understood what it means to manifest in the things of the Spirit. Praise God. Many of us who have found, if you did watch this, please, I'd, I'd like you to go back to the YouTube our YouTube channel to watch the teaching all over again. Understanding what, because in all lessons, I mentioned something, trying to clear that thing called the charisma, that is uh, the, gift, the giftings of the Spirit. There was something that I cleared basically in it. It was the fact that what? It does not mean that there's a special gift that came on you after receiving the Holy Spirit, but rather we see something manifested in you by the will of who? Of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Are you getting this now? So we see that the giftings have to do with manifestation. We all have what? The same spirit. Ephesians chapter 4, starting from verse 4, look at what he says. There is one body, one spirit, just as you are called in what? One hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, and one what? One baptism. Praise the Lord. Just trying to commemorate, you know, it's the same person who wrote the book of Romans. It's the same person who wrote the book of Ephesians. And it's the same person who wrote the book of 1 Corinthians. So you see that there's some, what would I say, similarity in what he's trying to pass across. There's a uniformity in it. Praise God. Talking about who? Paul. So he says, there's one God and Father of all who is above all and what? Through all and in you all. Praise the Lord. So the same Father is in everyone. Praise God. And we go in verse 7. He says, but to each one of us, Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. And we understand here is more of saying like that grace does not mean the salvation grace. Praise God. The problem with many people is every time they see a word, they, mean, they think it means the same thing all through. The word grace was used in what? In different what? Context. The same Paul says, I live by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. I am saved by grace. Hallelujah. And now he's saying everyone is giving grace. It's in different context, but you have to understand the whole picture. For some of you who attended the Bible study yesterday, there was something that we pointed out here in the fact that when actors are acting in a movie, you don't pay attention to the details. You pay attention to the what? The whole picture. The message that is being sent. Praise the Lord. That's why sometimes you cannot take some words or some scriptures literally. You have to look at the whole picture and the whole message. Hallelujah. So we'll go back again. Let me, before I continue here, Romans chapter 12 to see what he talked about in Romans chapter 12. Romans 12. Let me see. Praise the Lord. Verse 3, starting from verse 3. It says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more what? Highly than he ought to. Don't feel too exalted. Don't feel too what? Too proud. Don't think that you are more than this. There's something we say in my language, any kind Jawadi. One person cannot be we have come. Hallelujah. No matter how much he is, he's always I have come. Praise God. So don't think more than yourself. Sometimes you want to pass and somebody says, are you more than this? That's what you'll be saying. Are you, are you more than this? Is this not you? Praise God. Hallelujah. That's, that's the truth. So yeah, Paul is also saying something. Make sure. I'm telling you based on the grace that I've been given, that's according to the authority or the position. It's just like saying by the power vested in me. I'm telling you, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. But what? Think soberly. Somebody does not mean you carry your face cry. Praise God. It doesn't mean you start looking fake humility. That one is fake humility. You know, there are some people that are proud but look humble. You know that, right? I mean, they are so proud. They, talk, they don't talk much. You know, they're always like that. When they see you, they're always telling you, you know, I don't talk much. You know, you know I'm like this. I don't, I, don't, I don't make noise, you know. But when I move, I move. He's a proud person. <laughs> Hallelujah. But to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. In that translation, the manuscript, it will say the measure of faith or measure of the faith. It's not saying that one, I've explained this last week. It's not saying that one person has one faith that is greater than the other. And understand the faith that he's talking about here is not talking about faith for salvation. It's in context of manifestations of gift. It says, for as we have many members in one body, all members do not have the same function. Praise God. And I have explained something to you that Paul here is trying to give an, an, an example using the human body. 
And there's something that I pass across. It's important that this part of the body cannot claim is the most important. Hallelujah. Neither should the last, you know, the pinky toe, or the, that, that last toe, should not be claiming too much. Praise God. Or rather, let not the other part of the body look down on the pinky toe and say, this one is not important. Get a hammer and hit it on the pinky toe, then you understand how important that part is to the body. Praise God. So now, Paul is using that same example, using the human body. Saying just the same way the human body, they are all part of one body. Praise God. I, I've said this before. If Brother Emmanuel appears now, you don't say, you don't give Brother Emmanuel's hand one name and give the left a right hand another name and give the left leg. No. When his whole person appears, what do you refer to him as? Emmanuel. One person. Although, to make up this one person, he has a brain, he has a spinal cord, he has two, two arms, two legs, all these things make up this person. Hallelujah. So, now, this is what Paul is trying to say. In that same way, we have people in the church, but we want different functions. Praise God. Different what? Function. So, we have been many are one body in Christ. Though we are one million, we are what? One body in Christ. Though we are ten billion, we are one body in Christ. And individually members of one another. Because when we are talking about spiritual things, it's important for you to know where your place is in church and function effectively there. Praise God. It's not enough that you pray in tongues and you can interpret tongues. Hallelujah. It's not enough that you can pray for the sick and get healed. You need to understand what is your function within the body. These are things that help you walk more in the supernatural or rather in the manifestation of the spiritual. Praise God. Because most of the times when you find your function within the church, you manifest so easily the, uh, the gifts of the spirit that pertain to that, that, what would I call it, that office. Hallelujah. You find yourself just operating easily. Not that you can operate in others, but you realize that for the sake of this function, you operate easily there. Hallelujah. So he says, so we be many among body, having then gifts different according to the grace that is given unto us. Let us use them. He said, if it is prophecy, let us what? Prophesy, based on the proportion of faith that is allotted. If it is ministry, what does this ministry mean, brethren? What does this ministry mean? <laughs> Service. Does it mean apostle over the house of God? Uh, I've, I've explained this ministry. If it is ministry, that is, if you are one that is good at serving. Let me look at Amplified Version and then see what Amplified says. Verse 7. He whose gift is practical service. You see? That's what ministry. In context, practical what? Service. It means it's not mouth service. Not mouth service. I'll be there. One a.m. I'll be there. So, Shall be the time the seven a.m. By one, I'll be there. Praise God. What do we need, sir? There are some people who can carry you on. Hallelujah. I mean, they will lead you on and say, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. And when that time comes, you call their phone, they don't pick it anymore. He says what? If it is practical service, let him give himself to seven. He who teaches to his teaching. He who exhorts, that is those that encourage. Praise God. I'm going to break it down. There's a reason I'm coming from Romans 12, then I'll go back to Ephesians 4. Now, Ephesians 4 talks, and 1 Corinthians 12, talks about some of these gifts. You know, there are some parts that Romans mentioned that Ephesians did not mention, and there are some parts that Ephesians mentioned that, or that 1 Corinthians mentioned and Ephesians didn't mention. So we're going to go through that. He says, those who prophesy, let them prophesy. And we understand that prophecy is a gift of the Spirit, is a manifestation of the Spirit. So any born-again believer can prophesy. Hallelujah. Amen. Because it is based on the Holy Spirit. Any born-again believer can be moved to prophesy. And what we understand, I will we'll go that details in talk, talking about the prophets. So he says, and let him who teach, let him also teach effectively. You do realize that some people who have grace for teaching. When I mean grace for teaching, you understand, that means they teach stresslessly. You do realize that when they teach, they're able to break things down for you to understand clearly. You understand what I'm trying to say? There are some people who have knowledge of truth. They know the truth. But they have difficulty in passing it across. That is, in teaching for a layman to understand clearly. But there are those that, and you find most of these people in Sunday school. I'm not talking about the adult Sunday school. You find them in children's church. Why am I saying this? Because it takes a whole lot of teaching ability to be able to break down complex truths for children to understand. 
Just like when Brother Toby was saying yesterday in the Sunday school when he said, in the way they described Jesus, was Jesus that God took his picture and sent it to us, sent it to us. And that picture was Jesus. So when we want to know God, we look at what? Look at Jesus. Now, see, that's an explanation. It's not something that anybody can just come up and say to a child. You have to have a teaching ability. Ability to break things down. And for those of you who have taught in primary schools, may have taught in primary school and secondary school, when they take you for training, the first thing they tell you is how to break down this teaching for a one-year-old to grasp it. Most times they ask us to use songs, so we have to sing because songs stay in our head. There are songs that we took in nursery school that we have not forgotten till today. Hallelujah. He says, he who teaches in teaching. He who exhorts in exhortation. That means there are some certain people who have this ability to, what would I call it? Exhort. Give sound advice. Motivate you. When you come in contact with them, they're able to bring you back on track. When you just go to them for some certain advice or some certain words of encouragement or words of exhortation, when they don't get you, they're able to tell you, Brother, why don't you do this? And then you, you live there, you say, every time I come to talk to you, hallelujah, I always feel relieved, hallelujah. You find that the brothers who know how to do this a lot end up finding wife easily. Why? Because when a lady comes for cancer, after five minutes, she feels relieved. Next week, she'll come again. Before you know it, you say, this guy gives me this guy. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> hallelujah. Let me be married here. Praise the Lord. Now, is, let him who exhort, let him exhort. Praise God, give me some, some minute. Now, and what? He who contributes, let him do it in what? In what? In simplicity. If I truth think NKJV says, he who gives, let him give what? With liberality. Don't attach too much. Huh? So how much does the church need now? I'm giving an example. 5,000. Huh? 5,000. Huh? 5,000. It's big money, oh. <laughs> you see that give, she wants to give or he wants to give but it's becoming complex pastor you know it's not easy nowadays we work, give the money if you want to give <laughs> hallelujah if you want to do this, do this in what? in simplicity hallelujah I'm always losing where and then, but he who gives aid and superintends with zeal and singleness of mind if I use it here in, verse, in NKJV it says he will lead let him lead with what? With diligent. He who shows mercy, let him do it with what? Cheerfulness. That mercy in context is those that give to charity. You understand? Those who are able to help. Not just giving charity. They are, when they find people that are going through stress, praise God. I met a lady one time and we were walking together and there was a kid on the ground. The kid was just moving on the sand. It was there to kind of. And I was in undergraduate university. I was still young. So by the time we were walking, she stopped. I mean, I, I would not have stopped. I don't know who wants this kid. That's what would have come to my mind. Who wants this kid? Why is this kid playing here? She stopped, picked up the child, dusted him up, cleaned everything on his body. She had a meat bag with her, gave it to him. I said, this is mine. Just take it. Where's your mom? Who wants this child? He meant I paused. I was lost. I mean, I was like, yes, it actually takes some sense of, how would I call it? Let's use our label. It takes grace for somebody to actually put that and say, no, 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 no I need to take care of this child. Didn't you see what that girl was going through? You find some people who naturally can just do this. Not, not everybody should be able to do that, praise God. I mean, everybody should be able to do that. I'm sure everybody here does that. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, everybody should be able to show mercy and give, but hey, it is well. May we receive the grace. Yeah. Hallelujah. So I just want to break down this Romans 12. So we go back to Ephesians chapter 4, which is actually the text for today. Ephesians chapter 4. Now the Bible says, But to each one of us grace was given, verse 7, according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led what? Captivity captives and gave gift unto men. Now what does it mean that he has ascended? It meant that at some point he descended, that's what he's explaining here. What does he mean? But also, he first descended to the lower part of the earth, and then what? He ascended. And this is what I'm talking about. If there was no resurrection of Christ, we would not be talking of gift of the Spirit. We would actually not be talking of the Holy Spirit. The fact that he resurrected is what gives us this context to talk about this. So he says, he himself, in verse 11, gave unto some, now this is what we're going to pick up now. He gave unto some what? 
apostles. Oh my God, the screen is not working. Okay, this is working. He gave unto some apostles, unto another what? Prophet. Mark those parts in your Bible. He gave unto some evangelists, and unto some what? Pastors and teachers. <laughs> Praise God. In actual manuscripts, scholars say the pastors and teachers are not separate. They're actually together. Pastors, that is, teachers. Praise God. And we're going to break it down together. So pastors and teachers, what, do, what are these people supposed to do for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ? You see, the functions of these offices have to do what? With where? The body of Christ. They have nothing to do with outside. They have something to do with what? The body of Christ. And they have something to do also for the equipping of the saints. To so who are the saints? All the believers. So the goal of everyone in this office is to what? It's not for them to glory in saying I'm an apostle. As a matter of fact, there's nothing in the Bible that makes you say put apostle before your name. There is no way to say that you should put prophet before your name. A certain man, Ananias, who is a prophet of God. But, praise God, not prophet Ananias. Are you getting this now? A certain man called Paul, who is a what? An apostle of Jesus Christ. Not apostle Paul. We call him apostle Paul. He never called himself apostle Paul. He says, brother Paul, an apostle of Christ. Servant of the living God. Are you getting this now? Just the same way Peter, an apostle of Christ. So nowhere does he say you put, <laughs> hallelujah, that's why I said I have a problem when I see someone putting his name on Facebook and in the first place put pastor or something, something. I'm like, what is, is that one needed? <laughs> Hallelujah. So I mean, I met someone and I said, what's your name? He said, my name is brother. This. Your name is not brother. <laughs> your name is your name. Your name is not pastor. Your name is your name. If I meet you today, what's, my, what's your name? I'll tell you my name is Olatun. Because that's my name. Praise God. Praise God. So he says, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What goes on? What's the goal? Till we all come to what? To the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So what's the goal? The goal is that we come to the unity of faith. The goal is not that we keep having different doctrines. The goal is that we come to the unity of the faith. And we come to the what? To the same knowledge of the Son of God. That's why these people were situated or put in the church. Jesus knew this. That not everybody will come to the full understanding of what he had done. So he needed to set, set some certain people within the church to ensure that they communicate these things. Not that they hoard it. So what I say to you in the dark what do you do? You proclaim it on the mountain tops. Not that you come and hold it and say, there are some certain truths that I know. This is not forex, you know? There are some certain truths or some certain gimmicks or schemes that I know that I'm not going to tell you. But don't worry. By the time you, you know, just keep growing. You are still a small boy, you know? How many hours did you pray? Two? Yeah, you know, you are still coming up. You are coming up. Praise God. When you get eight hours, you will see things. But I can't tell you the realms that I've been to. This is not what God gave you the gift for. Is that you come to the unity of faith. That we get to that same knowledge of the Son of God. So that we are no longer what? Tossed to and fro like children. Only children are tossed to and fro. Only children are tossed to and fro. Tell them it is here, they are there. No, 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 Santa Claus is here. They'll come here. No, 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 he's here now, they move here. You find children are the ones that are tossed to and fro. By what? Every wind of doctrine. Tossed to and fro by what again? By the trickery of men. In the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. You know who used to plot? As people that write movies, they know how to write a plot. When they say there's a plot, I praise God. It takes deliberate, conscious sitting down to plot something. So you find people who are plotting trickery. Deception. But the goal is that as your pastor, as the apostle, as the prophet, as the evangelist, as the teacher, the goal is that what? You come to this knowledge of the Son of God. Praise God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 12 again. I hope you've marked those offices in your Bible. And you also marked the one in Romans chapter 12. 
Now, in Romans, First Corinthians. 12, 27. Now it says, now you are the body of Christ and members what? Individual. You are the body of Christ, individual members. Now what does it go on? And God has appointed these in where? In church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. Notice here, evangelist is not there. Hallelujah. Is it there? Notice again, pastor is not there. Teachers remains. Hallelujah. It says, third teachers. After that, what happens? Miracles, then gift of healings, helps, administrations, variety of tongues. Let's pause there. So now we're going to take these things one after the other. Praise God. He says, first apostle. Who's an apostle? Give me, give me, give me, give me an example from who's an apostle? Sent one. Jesus is the sent one. Is he an apostle? <laughs> Thank you. His messenger. He says sent one. He gives another meaning. That you will give some people the license to continue in their special, uh, what would I call it? In their special position that they are right now. An apostle simply means a special messenger. It's from the Greek word apostolos, it means a messenger. And usually when there's a messenger, what does the messenger carry? He carries a message. Is the messenger powerful in himself? No. no. He's just a messenger. He's a conduit. He's a conductor. He's not the source of the electricity. However, he conducts the flow of electricity. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? He's just a messenger. He bears the message of one who sent him. So when he goes to deliver the message, he does not deliver the message on his own personal opinions. He does not deliver the message that he loves to deliver. He delivers the message that he is sent to deliver. Are you getting this now? And when he's also carrying a message, it means he's carrying this message to a set of people. Hallelujah. The reasons that the first disciples after Jesus rose from the dead were called apostles were because when they were sent once. All of them were apostles. Hallelujah. And they were sent. Mostly, most of them ministered to the Jews. Praise God. Most of them delivered the message to the Jews. But when it came to a time, while they were praying in the book of Acts, the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit spoke about them, what did he tell them? Separate for me what? Barnabas and Paul. For I have a special what? Duty for me. He said, I will show Paul how much he must what? Suffer for me. And then Paul later mentioned that the same God who worked in Peter for the apostleship of Peter to the Jews is the same one who worked in me for the apostleship of myself to who? The Gentiles. So an apostle is one who is sent with a message. And in the Christendom, the apostle is sent with one message. Please who's that? That's all. He's sent with one message, which is Christ, the gospel. There is no other special message. That's why they are called apostles. Every time Paul will address himself, he said, I, Paul, what? Seven of God, apostle of Christ. Hallelujah. In the fact that he carries one message, and that message is Christ. There is no apostle of end time. Praise God. I mean, you should understand what I'm trying to say. I, I give another, another personal stuff. There were no pastors before the church started. So he sent the disciples to deliver the message. You realize that it is after you deliver the message and you have proclaimed the gospel and people have believed, then you need what? You get what I'm trying to say? I will explain what pastors, so you understand what I'm, I'm getting from. So when he says, first the apostles, you should understand. It's not to come and tell me that apostle is greater in anointing to an evangelist. There is no scripture that says that. However, because you are sent as a messenger of the gospel, there are power gifts that will flow through you. Why? For the sake of the gospel. The Bible says, and he confirmed his word with what? With signs follow. Everywhere they went preaching the word of God, there were signs confirming it. Why? To validate the message. Or what would I say? To accompany the message rather. Hallelujah. So most times when they went and they proclaimed the gospel, there were signs following it. So because you are sent to a people and you are sent to minister to them, of course you find the power of God flowing through you. 
It doesn't mean that you are anointed specially. However, you've been entrusted a service. Paul says, I'm not doing this for money. If I were doing this willingly, perhaps I would have asked for a reward. But what? I am compelled to do it. Woe is me if I do not what? If I do not preach the gospel. Because God himself has separated me from my mother's womb for this time. And I understand the gravity of this office that I carry. So it's a place of responsibility, not a place of title. It's not a place of title. Sincerely, it's not. All this, somebody told me something while we were with Pastor Mika to St. Barnabas' rooms, and we're seeing all the arrangements, you know, the bishop, you know, he would stand like this and that. You know, there was something better that he said. He said, the apostles never had time for all these types of things. Because they were so busy thinking that the world was going to end in their time. If you read the letters of Paul and all of them, you, they almost thought that it's tomorrow. They never thought that 2,000 years after or 3,000 years after, we'll still be here talking about this gospel. So they had no time to be reasoning about I am apostle this, I am pastor this, I am bishop this, praise God. Many of the arrangements and all these religious ordinances happened years after these guys had gone. And that's why Paul tried to address this even before he left. Because these things will happen. Praise the Lord. So if I, it's not for title. Praise God. It's like I kept saying something. I do not call you a mechanic because you say you're a mechanic. I call you one because I see you doing it. It's by reason of responsibility. What you do is what defines what we call you. You see that you ask me, Apostle, Apostle, this, we have you going to proclaim the message nowhere. Praise God. You have not proclaimed message anywhere. You've done nothing. You see that and say, and I'm, I'm wondering how people pack apostle, prophet, evangelist. Have you seen that before? How do you do that? Please, how do you do it? <laughs> Praise God. Apostle, prophet, evangelist. What, what needest thou for the titles? Just do something. Let people call you that. Not you. Praise God. So you find what the first one, apostles. Now the next one that they talk about in Ephesians 4.11. What's the next? Prophets. Who are prophets? Prophetess. I mean, or prophetess. Let me use... No, prophetess in Greek. Uh, I'm trying to say it in Greek. Ephesians 4.11. Who are prophets? In normal context, it will mean those who can predict the future. Hallelujah. Those who can tell or foretell events. But if you open Amplified Version, you will see something there. It called Apostle Special Messengers. In Amplified Version, it says, Some prophet, in bracket, he put inspired preachers and expounders. These ones are able to preach the word of God and expound on the word of God by inspiration. Of course, like I kept saying, Christ must be the underlying message. So a prophet is not just one who can predict the future. And I've said something that when we talked about the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit, you find out that mostly, not that they are limited to that, but you find that mostly prophets operate mostly in the revelational gift or the revelational manifestation. Talking about what? Word of knowledge, words of, uh, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirit. You find that they just operate mostly in that because most of what, what manifests to them in that office has more to do with spiritual inspiration. Praise God. So it is necessary that they're able to discern and give word of knowledge because one of the definitions of a prophet is actually one who can foretell the future or who can predict the future. But that does not mean that's all he does. One of the major things is to check for in a prophet if he is able to reveal Christ. What is inspired to teach is he Christ like? Is in line with Christ. Because today we have so many prophets. And I need to clear out something. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says that in those days God spoke to us through what? Prophets. Now in the latter days he has spoken to us through his what? Through his sons. So the job of the prophet in those days under the old covenant is different from the job of a prophet in the new covenant. Praise God. The prophet under the old covenant was the only mouthpiece of God. Was the only one who guided, who gave guide to even the king. That is, the king knew nothing except by the prophet. So he was literally the mouthpiece of God, the compass for the people. He was the only one who could say, this is what God is saying now. So that means if the prophet wakes up tomorrow and says, let me even deal with this king. I mean, you understand what I mean? I mean, 
Let me show them that all oh, their whatever depends on me. So he wakes up and say, Oh king, who should we use name here? Who has a very powerful Bible name here? <laughs> Praise God. Oh king, this. Today God said you should crawl on your four legs. Because if you want to win the war, you have to crawl on your four legs and back like a dog. You know the king will literally do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. The king will literally do that because they are the mouthpiece of God. You know what happened when it was a name, man? Are these people who came to arrest? They were looking for the king. And then somebody told him, he said, There is one person in Israel. Is, is, the person giving your plans to the Israel king is not a spy. There is one prophet there that whatever you do in your bedroom, he knows. So they went there to arrest him. So by the time they go, they say, Ah, my father, my father, they have come to take you. He, he told the servants, he said, come on. Those that are with us are more than they that are with them. That one they don't understand because it's mysterious. Right? Praise God. I know these are the stories that we like to hear. That's what these prophets used to hold us down today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. So he says, and he says, okay, Father, open, their, open his eyes that he might see. And when he opened his eyes, what did he see? He saw a chariot of fire. He said, hey, my father, the chariot of Israel. The prophet was just there, saying, relax, calm down. It's something that I see every day. Praise God. I mean, he was feeling cool. But what did he do? What did he do to the soldiers? The Bible says he struck all the soldiers with blindness. That's a prophet. Because he's the only seer. He's the only communicate, communicator, or what I call it, with God. So he said, you're looking for somebody, Abby. I'll take you to where he is. So he guided all of them to the king's palace. You know, you imagine what the king would have said. Wow, free me. What did the king call the prophet? He said, my father, my father, shall I slay them? He called, the king called the prophet father. I heard the minister say something. He said, the king called the prophet fathers. Prophets are fathers. I said, that's a misplaced, misplaced interpretation. Come on. That's a misplaced interpretation. Now, that was what they did then. But the prophets in the New Testament are different. Why? Because every believer has the Holy Spirit. God speaks directly to every believer. I tell you again, if you have to depend on a third party to tell you things about you, there's a problem with your fellowship with God. Or rather, there's a problem with your knowledge of what is inside of you. Because right now, the Bible says, He has spoken to us through who? Through His Son. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1. God has spoken to us through His Son. And how? We have a Son in us. We have the Holy Spirit. When he looked at the disciples, he says, I have many things that I have to tell you. But I what? I cannot tell you now. You can't bear them. But I'll be when the spirit of truth is come. He will bring you to what he remembers what all things. He will teach you all things. And where is the spirit of truth? Inside you. First John says, you have an anointing. And the anointing teaches you all things. That anointing is not something, not oil. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. This was the anointing. That's what is inside you. So God speaks to every believer directly. So prophets are not there for third party. So what are they there for? They are there for edification. Are you getting this now? They are there for what? Edification. It's not to come and give me hook, line, and sinker. Brother, brother Emmanuel, can you give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar? Switch off your phone and give it to me. That's not what prophets are there for. That's not edifying. So when you want to do such, you bring, you bring example from who? You see Elijah, Elisha? You say, he went to the woman and said, make for me first. He says, so even if you are hungry, make for me first. What? Praise God. When you, when you meet someone like that, what you should tell them next is, after I make for you first, this farming must be over. Because after she made for the, for the prophet first, what happened? The Bible says they did not lose any food throughout. So I'll tell you, will you guarantee that if I give you this my last dime, throughout your, your life, I will be spending money. <laughs> Praise God. I'm giving an example to tell you that it has nothing to do with the old covenant way. The prophets then were their Messiah. You understand what I mean? You remember that woman whose husband died in 2 Kings 13? Whose husband died? The prophet left a lot of what? Death. And she didn't have to pay. So she had to run to who? The prophets. The prophets then were there like Messiahs. The prophet is not a Messiah today. If anybody is a prophet, he's there to edify the body. Praise God. 
So even if he sees vision, we've seen, we saw Agabus in the book of Acts, where what? He saw a vision of what was going to happen. Now, a famine is coming. This is what I see. And notice what they did. They did not begin to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, every spirit of famine, we cast them back. The Bible says, he has given to us the healing for inheritance. No, the Bible didn't say that. <laughs> the Bible said, when they saw that vision, what happened? They began to gather their resources, wisdom. Famine is coming, begin to save money. Recession is happening. They tell you, show up to go up. You will cry. You will cry. <laughs> Praise God. Wisdom. Even Joseph, who had relationship with God, when he saw that vision of seven years of plenty and seven years of what? Of famine. What did he do? Economist. He planned it well for them. Such that during the seven years of famine, it is that saying, God, you are able to turn famine to plenty. Father. Thank you. Hallelujah. So prophets are there just to edify the body. In case, you know, most times when prophets speak things by inspiration, believers have the Holy Spirit. You can find the confirmation in your spirit that, yes, this is actually what the Lord is saying. For right now, we are so sure that now God is saying something so specifically now that there will be more local churches. And these local churches will be focused on the teachings of Christ. You are going to find young people going out, setting out cell meetings just to ensure that Christ is taught. I mean, that's, that's not, what would I call it? It's not guesswork. It's actually happening. So what they are there, you see, when somebody comes and gives such prophecy, you know how edified you'll be? I mean, all of you, members of yours, somebody comes and gives a prophecy that we are seeing that all the mega kind of mega structure order of Christianity that we have seen is going away. We are seeing local churches raised up. We are seeing people focus more on Jesus and not on materialism. We are seeing young people picking up the gospel. Don't you get edified? Don't you get happy? Don't you rejoice? That's what prophecy is all about. To edify the body of Christ. When that man and an ass, God told him, I have, go and meet Paul. He's somewhere and he's what? He's blind. Go there and pray for him. Do you know what that guy did? Instead of obeying instruction, that's how he put the story for today, he began to accuse Paul. He said, how can I ask God, how can you call that guy? Is he not the same guy that has been killing all the Christians? It's impossible. God said, I have called him. You go and do what I ask you. Praise the Lord. So that's prophet. Sir. Then he says, evangelist. Praise God. Evangelist. Who's an evangelist, brother? Who's an evangelist? A what? Well, we gave this missionary. I say every minister, every born again believer is an evangelist. Because they are ones who proclaim the gospel. I know we like saying Philip the evangelist, but the reason we call him Philip the evangelist is because he went to proclaim the gospel. But the truth is, what he did was not different from any other office. He went there, proclaimed the gospel, did signs and wonders, did miracles, and was even able to teach. And he did not just preach. You find out that the spirit caught him. He said, join yourself with the chariot. Immediately, the Bible says he was in the chariot. <laughs> Praise the Lord. You get that? And what you notice about something in particular with those who proclaim the gospel, you will always find that signs and wonders are manifested. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Because it's because of the gospel. Rather, it's because of the gospel. When you proclaim the gospel, you are bound to see signs and wonders manifest. Because you are delivering a message of someone who sent you. So it's an evangelist. The next one is what? The pastors and teachers. In, in, the, in the essence of pastor, the meaning of pastor in itself, the context, it means a shepherd. One who, you see, you can't be a pastor and have no flock. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? You can't call yourself a pastor and you have no people that you are overseeing. You see, another um, replacement of this word pastor is what Paul used bishop in 1 Timothy. Or is it 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy? 1 Timothy, where he says, if any man desires to be a what? A bishop. Then a bishop is not... <laughs> bishop is not the highest. It's God. Bishop is not the highest kid down of office that, you know, I'm the bishop, he's the pastor. The bishop is literally an overseer too. Someone who oversees the congregation. 
And he says, pastors and teachers. There's a reason he put them together. Because how do you shepherd when you can't teach? How do you guide a flock? All through Jesus is that there was something he constantly did with the disciples. He did miracles for people outside, but he did what to the disciples? He taught them. Teaching. See, miracles can easily be forgotten in history. Teachings can be passed to generations. You understand what I'm saying? When you hand down sound teaching, he goes down to generations. Miracles can easily be forgotten. Hallelujah. If not for that many people, you read the book called The God's Generals. You might not even remember many miracles that Catherine Kuhlman did. But teachings, teachings will always endure. Jesus spent most of his time teaching the disciples. And even after he rose, the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 1, he was with them how many days? 40 days. Teaching them things concerning the kingdom. Who is a teacher? He's called Didascalos. That's the Greek word, that's scholars, which actually means what? A doctor, a master, a teacher. When I say doctor, I don't mean doctor in medicine. He's a doctor in terms of in things of reading, of literature. He understands, he's able to teach. And most times in writing also. Hallelujah. So a teacher is one who can expound, give breakdown the things of God. And that's why today you realize that the body of Christ, if it needs anything today, we need what? Teachers. We need people who are able to bring believers to who they are. Many, many ministries are shutting down the ministry of teaching. What are we doing now? We are rather replacing the gospel with many things. With power, with what? With authority, with proclamation, with decreeing. You understand? And with rhymes and quotable quotes. You understand what I mean? Rhymes and quotable quotes. You're able to, if you can put, if this is the, this is the, this is the, yes, and somebody will shout and say, what? <laughs> you used to jump. We all used to jump. When they used to say all those things, they would jump up and say, preach, pastor, Good hallelujah. Hallelujah. A teacher is one who is able to break things down for you to understand? And in the body of Christ, listen, if your pastor, after your years of sitting under him, is not able to bring you to the knowledge of who you are, where you are, what you can do, who is inside of you as a believer, I don't think you're under a pastor. If all your life is to depend on the pastor, Praise God. I mean, if after three years in use, you meet somebody else and you still say, let's bring him to Bible. So, so that Brother Tobi will explain to him. Or so that Brother Tobi will explain to him. Or Sister Rema. Yes, I have failed him. It's two ways. Either I have failed or you are a very, very, very no. indolent student. <laughs> <laughs> very lazy student who refused to learn. Why? Because as a pastor, his goal is to edify. Look, look at the underlining thing in the next verse. There it says, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. Who does the work of the ministry? The saints. Who plays football? Is it the coach? So what does the coach do in the training session? To equip the footballers for what? For the game of what? Football. In what? In strategies, in trainings, in strength, in endurance, in all things. Why is it that when a, when a club fails, they don't sack all the players? They sack the coach. They say you have not done your job well. If you did your job well, these players will play well. That's the same thing in the kingdom. The pastors and the teachers, all these offices, they are like coaches who sit there and train the believers and send them forth. Hallelujah. And what? They send them forth, the pastors and teachers. Praise the Lord. So you see, we have apostles, a special messenger. We have the prophets, we have the evangelists, we have the pastors, and we have the teachers. Praise God, both of them together. But if you go back to 1 Corinthians 12, there are some other things that he added. 1 Corinthians 12, there are some other things that he added. 12, 27. Now he says, first of all, second, the prophet, teachers, miracles, gift of healings. We have talked about this being what? Manifestations. Helps. What are helps? 
helps. In other in context, it means relief. There are people who just like to. They are, that's why I hear people say I'm in the ministry of helps. <laughs> Hallelujah. But anything that brings relief in the body of Christ. An example of someone is a minister of health. Any example? Huh? Eh? The one? Sister Julia. <laughs> yeah, in the ministry of health. Praise the Lord. Yeah, because uh, because in, in Romans, he says there are some who have the gift of administration. There are those who are able to coordinate. They might not necessarily stand by the pulpit. But you find that they have, they have gift of administration. They can manage. Maybe transport the administrators, managing the, administrating the ministry of food, which is a very important ministry. They, administ- they, they administer that also. You find there are those who are good at maintaining the offering. Praise God. How many saw the last presentation on our offering? I think, that, I think that's why they mentioned Sister Juliet. Praise God. Because those ones are good in documenting and ensuring that everything goes according to plan. These people we must recognize within what? Within the body of Christ. Notice all these ministries have to do with what? The church. That is the body of Christ. Outside the body of Christ, you can have your job. Are you getting this? You could be a tailor. You could be a teacher outside. You could be an accountant outside. I mean, that's outside, the, but that's in the secular world. These are things that are, like I keep saying, your certificate ends here. You know that, right? I mean, that's the truth. The truth is, whatever we study in school is for ourselves. Let's be realistic. It's for ourselves. It ends here for the secular world. But in the body of Christ, these carry what eternal value. They do not just end here. You get rewards for what you do within the body of Christ. So as a believer, like I wanted to say something about evangelists. Also, you find that the evangelist, when he's proclaiming the gospel, certain manifestations happen that are so mighty and powerful. Praise God. By reason of what he does. You find the pastor, the teacher or so, ha, you realize that there's something particular about him. Let's see what is particular about the pastor. Praise God. First, I think it's First Timothy, right? Praise God. I think it's the book. If somebody can remind me. First Timothy 1. I mean, all right, now. It says, this is a faithful saying. If any man desires to be what? A bishop. He desires a good, he desires a good work. Paul terms it as a what? A work. And it's a good thing to want to be a pastor. It's a good thing to want to be a bishop. It's a good thing. Amplified says, if you desire to be a superintendent, an overseer. You see, this is similar to a pastor. You are overseeing, you could be a bishop of this branch, another person is a bishop of that branch. There's nothing particular. Hallelujah. Paul was not the super bishop. <laughs> he was an apostle. But he says that a bishop must be what? Blameless, husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable. There's something I want to pick there. He must be apt to teach. It is important. There's nothing called... I am a pastor, but I cannot teach. Please, resign. <laughs> Are you getting this? He said, God called me as a pastor, but he didn't call me to teach. My question is, how have you been pastoring? Hallelujah. I remember Kenneth Higgin said something of blessed memory. He said, I know that I started up Rema, um, that is the church, which is the what I realized that my son, Ken, is called to pastor. So I allow him to pastor. He knew what that he, the person was more into pastoring than he was into. So he says, no, I allowed him to operate in that function. When you're a pastor and you, you say you can't teach, there's a big problem. And you're not hospitable. Every time you carry your face, they cannot come and greet you in the house. <laughs> Members do not even know your house. Hallelujah. I mean, somebody said, be careful of a pastor, you don't know his private life. I mean, you don't know his privacy, I mean, his private life apart from when you see him in church. You have to be careful. Because you need to know who your pastor is. He must be hospitable. How do we tell if you have good behavior? How? Praise God. 
<laughs> your pastor Mu, he, he, I want to say in Yoruba, he, they call him Musa Fuerto. The pastor stays in a place where nobody can get to. The only time you see him is in church. Listen, I'd like to say something very clearly here. Pastoring has nothing to do with celebrity status. Neither does it have anything to do with isolation. No. A shepherd spends his time with what? With the sheep. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? A shepherd spends his time with the sheep. You don't find a shepherd staying far away. The sheep won't obey him. Because they don't have what? Constant communication with him. So you tell me you have a, a, a friend of mine took a picture with his pastor. I'm talking of direct pastor, sir. Someone that pastors him that he's working for. So the first time he took the picture with him, guess what he said? He said, it's a privilege that I'm standing close to my pastor. After the... Then I laughed. <laughs> Why did I laugh? I laughed because what? That's a wrong concept. I have to ask you a question. How have you been sitting under this man? If you've not been, if you are seeing it as a privilege once in how many years to stand beside him? How has he been your pastor? What reach does he have over your life? This is why we keep saying the local church is important. And forget this, the local church is important. The reason for the local church is so that what, you can easily blend with each other and know each other. You have to know your shepherd. Forget that thing that you should not see your pastor playing. I played long tennis with my pastor before many times. We've gone on... Hallelujah. <laughs> We've gone on the mountain. Tread, do not hiking trip. And we talk like normal human beings. It, does, it did not reduce my respect for him one bit. Not once. When I see him, I know he's my pastor. And I honor him that way. Still we joke. When we go to his house, we play games. Not once did he respect. It's an African mentality to say if you play with people, you lose respect. I'm saying it's that person that has problem, not you. It's that one that is not well trained. If by your closeness to a member and the person begins to disrespect you, that one is not well trained. He needs to be trained. No matter how much my father plays with me, I know he's my father. The day I mistakenly said you guys to my friend, I said, if I ever hear you guys from my own mouth again, are you okay? <laughs> how will you call us you guys? <laughs> Praise God. But you see, there's something they say, no matter how much a dog is mad, he recognizes its owner. Hallelujah. So your pastor is not somebody who is on a celebrity status. And be realistic. We have changed the whole thing around pastoral, pastoral stuff. Paul lived with these people, ate with them, worked amongst them. He's respected religious ones. He didn't even charge them. Hallelujah. So you might have many teachers. You have one father in it. I brought you to Christ. Whatever it is that you know, I brought you into it. And there's something that Paul said. He said, you know the manner of life we have lived among you. That means for them to know it, they must have seen him. I'll be realistic. Some people cannot testify to the manner of life their pastor has. I mean, the one that knows the pastor in the secular world, knows a different shade of the pastor, and then you that are in church, you know that's 50 shades of pastor. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. I mean, one person knows the other side, the other person, you don't even know. And when the other person comes and says, Me, do business with your pastor, I'm not serious. And then you are there, he's my pastor, my man of God. He will just look at you and say, You're not serious. Your pastor is number one for one now. Let me tell you what he did to us. He says here, He must be of good behavior. Husband of what? One wife. Temperate, sober-minded, hospitable, and what? Able to teach. Not giving to wine. Today is FS. Tomorrow is Pilsen. The next one, what they give? Moscato. Yeah, the next one. That your pastor is wonderful. One day, both of you minister from another team. <laughs> not from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Not given to wine. Not violent. 
not greedy for money. See, this is key. I mean, I, I thought we did you just focus about there's something about this pastor thing that the only thing he's asking me to have out. You see, if your pastor is greedy for money, he will preach another gospel. If he's greedy for money, he will what? He will preach another gospel. Which is not the gospel. Which is not another. Bible says it is not another. When you find a man that is greedy for money, he will do anything, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. He will do anything. I've shared this story before. Years ago, I was invited to minister somewhere. And then when I, was, when I went there to minister, I said, you're a minister, so... You know, you, I'm still young, so, but that one I was younger. Praise God. So we went there, we, we, and there was something about me. I, I used to like that bell routines. Like, when you come, they come and show them that you are. And I remember earlier that time, I, I, there was one man that was supposedly supposed to be my spiritual father. Thank God I broke from this hole. But I had gone and I had sold my latest blackberry to him. So as I sold it to him, he gave me mantu. Cover me with the mantu. Say, my son, this is mantu. That shirt was bigger than me, but I still wore, I didn't go to the tailor. I just wanted to keep the sanity of the mantle. So I wore that shirt. I tucked it in, it was big, and my neck was long. I'm not, I was not as fat now. My neck was long. If you see my picture then, I was very slim. So my neck was long in it. I still entered boss, went for the retreat. Went there, of course. When you are not ministry, you say, I'm wearing the mantle of my father. May say, Kaku Kole Mosa, raise your hand. You, you will do anything, and the funny thing about Nigerians is, just say that you're under the anointing, they will do anything. Ask them to stand on their head, they will. <laughs> I'm being realistic. That's how dumb some people are. Praise God. Thank God you are, you are broken. You are not there. Amen. You are not there. So it says, the Holy Spirit is my instruction. So we have done all those things. So another prophet came. A man was a prophet. Yeah, he was a prophet. So he stood and was ministering. So he called me man of God. You are called for greater things. You know when a prophet calls you man of God? You know how elevated you are. It means he didn't call you man of God because he saw you. He called you man of God because he saw it in the spirit. I said, Father, I'm willing to decide in the spirit. You know, like I'm mean, I mean established in the spirit. He's not just physically. So after he did that, he prayed for a certain number of people. So he told one of the members of fellowship, they said, go and take a powerful seed and sow it to this man of God. I wish, I wish that man did not do that that day. Immediately did that, my mind started calculating. Because he said powerful seed. And this brother was suffering. I knew. <laughs> but when he said powerful, he said, me. One, I said, God counted me worthy as being a man of God that will receive seed. <laughs> you see, at that point in time, you lose focus as a pastor. I was expecting, the, I knew that brother was suffering. I have gone, we've gone to their house many times to do video. They, we are going through a lot. So me, I was sitting there because God has counted me only to be a man of God to receive the seed. So I sat down there, and the, boys, the man said, he was not a boy, he was a man. I mean, as I then, years ago, he was over 30. But he used to call me sir because he felt I was a pastor. And all that. So they said, go and, go and show it to this man. I said, God, I'm expecting to see. I went back home, and I was calculating how much he might bring. I, I'm telling you the truth. I sized up his person. I realized that this is, so I, yes, maybe you bring 10,000 there, maybe 15, because he said powerful seed. Constantly, I was seeing this guy. He didn't talk about that seed. <laughs> he would give me sir. I mean, I would shake him. How is everything? He never mentioned the issue of ah. In my mind, I'd be like, is this one okay? Do you want to see breakthrough? They told you to bring seed, and you have not brought it. You see, my heart was fixed. You see, if my heart is fixed on that, every time I see him, I want to be talking in the lines of spiritual. I'm saying, you know, brother, this is this, this that happened. Now, just want to provoke him to talk about the seed. And then one day, one day, the Holy Spirit said, this guy will not bring the seed. Your heart is not right with me. Since when did you start caring about money? How old are you? How long have you gone in ministry that your eyes have already started pursuing money? Go and get yourself right. And thank God I got my head right. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prefer to spend for the gospel. Hallelujah. Understand it. When your pastor is greedy, you are in trouble. Yes, sir. I can let me tell you something. No matter how truthful the man teaches a message, when you see greed in him, 
notice there will be another gospel there. All his messages will end on the note of soul and relief. <laughs> All the things, because money has to come out. Especially when they begin to give you expensive gifts. You have to keep up with the Joneses. You have to keep up the life. That's why it's better to be moderate. So you don't have anybody to impress. Hallelujah. A man of God said one time, he said, many of the pastors have lost it today because they think this pastoral job is a competition with those in the secular job. So they become a pastor and they want to try to prove to their banker friends that they drive the same kind of car as the banker drives. Who called you to prove that? Must not be greedy for money. But gentle and not what? Not quarrelsome, not jagidi jagon. That is happening there. Call my pastor. He will bring Gobe. You try to beat me. I'll call my pastor for you. Not quarrelsome. And not what? Are you seeing that? Not uh, have you seen Are you seeing Kadali? So if you want to desire to be a pastor, please just go through these things. Not covetous. You know who's a covetous person? But I might wears, wears that wristwatch now. He wears a wristwatch and I look at it. No, I won't convert it here. I've seen the wristwatch. My eyes have seen it, right? Then I come and start preaching. Many times you need to sow. And what you need to sow is something that is dear to your heart. Because God will not bless you. For instance, now, how much do you buy this? You are covetous. Your eyes want what is not yours. And most times, it doesn't just steal material things. It, says it goes into people's wives, people's girlfriends. That's how it goes on. No, that's the truth. It goes on like that. Praise God. He rules his own house while having his children in submission. If a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? This is Paul equating the church of God to a what? A family setting. You see, I can't be distant from my family. You know, pastor was saying something. He said, you're a pastor of a church. Sit down and teach members of the church. Stop jumping up and down looking for class. This, son, this Sunday, you are not there. You have gone to another church. Another Sunday, you are there. You are jumping up and down. Your own people are told me you are not taking care of them. What kind of pastor are you? You are not the pastor to the world. You are not the general overseer of world enterprises. No! Sit down and teach your local church. When the time is right, you will travel. Must you even travel? Sit down, teach your local church and let them grow. Be faithful. I like why he says what? And he must not be a what? A novice. He must not be a what? A salis in Africa you find just because somebody got born again today and spoke in tongues today, the next morning they say, God is calling you to greater things. You know, I see God calling you to be a pastor. Immediately they made him a pastor. I got born again as a Muslim. And when I got born again as a Muslim, because they saw my zeal, they gave me positions. That, it almost killed me. It almost wrecked me. Because I was lifted up. I was puffed up immediately. Because I was saying, ah, I was, they saw everybody that I was the one they picked. He says, lest he be puffed up. And what? And pride, he fall into condemnation. I said, hallelujah. So you must understand that this is what the pastor, so if you want to be a pastor, if you desire to be a pastor, I used to say something, when they make someone pastor and he starts crying, I know he does not have any understanding at all, he's a big novice. He's a big time novice. Because ordaining you as a pastor is not a time for you to start shedding tears. Shedding tears about what? You think it's an achievement? What are you shedding tears for? No, I'm serious. I mean, what are you crying for? Achievement? Then the number is saying congratulations that you are a pastor. The only reason you are congratulated is because there are some pays that are attached to it. If there is nothing attached to nobody, congratulate you that you are a pastor. So they, they appointed you pastor. Oh, fellowship. Not so. Fellowship. You have become papa. They should not, they are, they are carrying your Bible for you. Good. Hallelujah. It's the truth. I mean, when, when did, when did, <laughs> if you get born again under somebody like Wade, they don't bore you where for you to carry Bible for you. I mean, it's the truth. Carry Bible. So your Bible has now become heavy. But you cannot carry it to the altar yourself. I mean, I'm being realistic here. Pastoral is, pastoral, I, I was talking with, I was talking about to be down that day, and then we were talking, I said, being a pastor is something that is not easy at all. It has, she said it has nothing to do with 
congratulations and being joyful. But that's the truth. It has nothing to do with achievement. It is labor. It's called what? Labor. He said, I labored more abundantly than them all. Ye have not heard about the grace of God. It's in labors, in sufferings, in sacrifices. I've tried to explain the certain gifts of the Spirit. And like the prayer that we made earlier, that was to be made earlier, is the fact that you must find where it is that you function within the body of Christ. Everybody has a function within the body of Christ. That's the only way we can function. Because after this, now we're going into the local church and the essence of the local church. Because if each one is just coming, for instance, we are in the body of Christ there, everybody just comes and says, the reason I'm going to church on Sunday is to come and be blessed. And you go back home. The church is not edified. The body of Christ is not edified. There's nothing. If you all come here and you all sing and we go back home, then we'll come back here. We are only meeting and jamboree. That's all. But when each one knows, this is what I want to do for the body. This is what I, I know I can do. Can I do it in my best of ability? Not this. Not. Everything you do in the body of Christ is having eternal reward. It doesn't end here. Hallelujah. Many of the people that Paul called his fellow workers or co-workers in Christ, most of them were not preachers. But he called them what? They are my what? Fellow workers. That is, there were some things that they gave I mean, even him talking about Junior, referring to Junior, even Priscilla and Aquila, the, house, the church in the household of, the household of Chloe, or what, uh, what is it? Now, you find out that most of the people he referred to as co-workers, they were people who served in their different capacities. Praise God. You know what Stephen was appointed to be? A thinking over what? Find where it is that you can serve the body of Christ and get stuck with it. Yes, as you do it, you find manifestation of spirit coming up. I mean, you find it flowing. But you understand that this is what I'm doing. I'm not overlapping. Praise God. If you know you are not, you don't have that grace, so don't force yourself to be a pastor. It is more than standing behind the pulpit. I tell you to God who made you. It is beyond standing behind the pulpit. It is beyond standing behind the pulpit and preaching message. Anybody can preach message. Anybody, anybody can enter Google and preach a message. It's the truth. Enter Google and Google all the join together, whatever, and come here and come and give us sound preaching. What pastor is beyond that? Praise God. So if you realize that, oh, I operate so much, you see, I operate so much in a prophetic gift, use it for the what? For the edification, not to come and make money from believers. Or to come and uh, steal people from under the pastor. You understand, sir? When you find people that are prophets, that's why they have, they have big problems in churches. So because they are able to see visions, they begin to meet members. I saw this, I saw that. You see, your pastor can never see it. The pastor is spiritually blind. Before you know it, you that you are a child, toss, toe, and throw, you will join him. Before you know the ministry has started, they've they broken. And then everybody is. You realize that prophets will be. You need the word of God to grow. Then you remain perpetually under the control of the prophet for as long as more. So if you're a prophet, use it for the edification of, all, of the body of Christ. I find people while, they are, while the pastor is preaching because they have some certain gifts of prophecy, the pastor is preaching, they stand up and say, Pastor, I have a word of God. Please just call, I have a word of nonsense. Pure nonsense. Now, you're not the pastor of the church. In every garden, there's always a pastor. And if the Lord has done that, you go back to him and say, Sir, this is what I'm seeing, right? But some of them even do this just to gain what? Uh, uh, not because they want to give a vision. They do this to gain entrance. And then you find that we are the one that made the church. Now we are the one. Those days we used to tell the pastor all these visions. I, meet, I met people like that. And I, I, I distanced myself from them. When you see the way they talk about the, the previous person, I say, we are the one. Without us, that church will not be standing. When you find someone talking like that, you know he's, he, this is a, this danger. You don't go into partnership with such person. It's going to destroy your life. If God has called you to the ministry of service, serve faithfully. I mean, praise God. <laughs> in whatever capacity. In whatever capacity. Prayer is for everyone. So everybody should be in that service of prayer. I mean, I ask you one question. If you truly see this place as your, as your place, I'm not calling you a church, but as your family, do you take up time during the day, just to pray. People not coming for prayer meeting. I mean, you pray for the body. 
or you come to church, you notice something, or you notice that somebody has not been conversed, and then you start praying. Or you take it upon yourself to follow up on that person and say, we've not been seeing you around, what's the problem? It's not the pastor. How many people will the pastor call? How many people does he, how many people will he be talking to? Praise God. So this, whatever you find yourself that you can do for the body of Christ, and not this, I'm not talking about you as alone. When I'm talking about the body of Christ, I'm talking general. Whatever it is that you can do for the body of Christ, do it with all this. Your allegiance is not to you. So when I mean, God did not say on that day, He will not set you, set us to It's your work to the body of Christ. But of course, you have responsibility to the family that you are fed with constantly. Hallelujah.